Well, hello everybody. This is Pastor Sarah and I am so very excited about being here with you guys tonight. I am looking forward to really just um, really getting into just some of the things when you are dealing with traumatic situations, when you are dealing with um, coming out of great loss or frustration, you know, a lot of times we have to find the tools that are necessary to rebuild and to start over. And when we're rebuilding and starting over, a lot of times it does not look exactly what we want it to look like, right? So welcome, welcome, welcome. I know you all are coming on and giving you all some time to get on here. And so I'm um, high, just tell me what's your name and where you're from. And we are going to do this really quick. And I have my brother coming on in a second and he is just going to help us. But I want this to be a very practical evening, right? So uh, let me see your name and where you're from while we're waiting. Thank you for your thumbs up. Thank you for your hearts, all of that. So tonight we are going to, like I said, we're dealing with, I'm doing a three day series on rebuilding your life, right? Rebuilding your life. When you're going through different situations, devastation, loss, separation, um, death, um, divorce, um, you know, just transition. When we're dealing with a lot of things, how do you, hi, Bruce. Um, how do you deal with having to rebuild your life with what you have? And sometimes what you have does not seem to be enough to rebuild anything, much less to build anything, right? So today I want to talk about the emotional aspect, because a lot of times as believers, unfortunately, hi, Haiti, <laughs> a lot of times we do not um, really, uh, one moment, allow for opportunity to just be weak and to be broken. Hi, Pakistan, how are you doing? How are you doing? And so I'm just getting my brother, he's going to come on today. And um, so emotionally as believers and as Christians a lot of times we do not get the chance and the opportunity to be emotional we get so much teaching and so much things on faith and you know you cannot have emotions and you know um that's him ringing the doorbell hi Arlington heaven you gonna open that for me thanks so um so sorry I'm a little distracted because he's coming in the door but we're going to start all over in a second and just telling you. All right. So here it is. As a believer, as a believer, we don't get the opportunity to really be emotional, right? A lot of times you hear that if you're really emotional, you're not trusting God. You are not being faith. You are, you know, just not a mature Christian and you don't, or you're controlled by your feelings. And what that can all a lot of times do is force us into not being human, force us not into a place where we don't need God because we're stuffing stuff so much in and blocking everything. But remember, in the book of Genesis, that God breathed life into man and he became a living soul, right? And inside of us, we have our body, we have our spirit, and we have our soul. Hi, St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Arlington. Hi, Rowlett. Hi, Pakistan. Again. So man became a living soul and inside our soul we have our intellect we have our will we have our emotions right we have all of this but a lot of times we we just deal with the will and we deal with the flesh but we don't talk about having a healthy emotional state and what is that supposed to look like people say hey you know what you need to be healed but what does healing look like is it healing based on your preference for me or is it healing based on god what is this healing criteria? And I want to encourage you tonight, right? So when we're talking about rebuilding and when you're talking about rebuilding from an emotional space, that is very key because when you are not, and I am not in a place of emotional soundness, our decisions will be filtered through that place. If I'm deficient, if I'm worried, if I'm anxious, if I'm depressed, if I'm angry, if I am irritated, if I'm nauseated, if all of those things, if I'm low in my confidence, all of those things can impact the decision and the next action that I take. And the next action I may take may not be in faith because I am not in that space. But if we don't give ourselves 
the opportunity to come before God and be bare before him as a living soul and say, God, this is where I am. If we don't have the tools that we need to recognize where we are emotionally, how will we mature in this place? So there are three things that I want to just share with you. And I want, then I'm going to ask my brother to come on because we have gone through some things together as siblings, some things that you guys can relate to. And, you know, a lot of times you never really see the other people that are involved whenever you're going through something, right? You only hear one side of a story or something like that, right? So I want to bring him in and he's a pastor in California, Life Church in Victorville. So anytime you, if you're at the Ontario airport, you go to Anaheim to go visit Disney, I want you to stop by, take you some uh, pills for the elevation so you won't get sick. But you are definitely going to have a good time when you go to his church. So let me just discuss two things or three things with you real quickly, right? Here they are. Number one, emotionally. Okay, what are some things that I can do emotionally to recover? A, you and I need a safe place. A safe place. A safe place where you and I can vent. We can get frustrated. We don't have to be perfect and pristine. We don't have to have all the right words, but we really can find somebody. No, that person may be a sibling. That person may be a friend. That may person may be a counselor, a coach, a therapist, a pastor. But there has to be somewhere that you can dump out. And of course, we have the Holy Spirit. And of course, we have God. But doesn't the Bible say, listen, when there's somebody weak among you, those of you who are strong come in and strengthen. And we always want to just take that as if they're sexually weak or they're tempted all the time or, you know, no, maybe when you're just weak, you need encouragement and it's okay. That scripture alone lets you know that we have a role to help those when they're weak, but that there is going to be times that we're weak. There is going to be times we're not processing everything just the way that it should be processed and stress and those things are real. If COVID didn't teach us anything else, it taught us that. So number one, you have to have a safe place where you can just vent. You can just, you know, be who you don't even know you are at the moment. And like I said, the reason I wanted my brother on here is because he's always been that first person for me, you know, in a lot of situations, right? And so the benefit of that for me is, when you have somebody that knows you as who you are and can be, when you are in a position and a moment where you're really broken down and you're really stressed and you're really hurt, and you're really angry, they can hear you out and then remind you of who you really are, but not judge you in the space and go, I can't believe it. You know the Bible all these years. No, you know that it's going to turn around for your good. Sorry, you know that. Why are you coming? No, he can just hear me out. Because sometimes I need to hear how crazy I am in a moment. <laughs> or sometimes I just need to, to, to be, you know, that person. And you and I need a safe place where you will not be judged, but you can process your emotions. All right. Number two, you need support. You need support that's going to push you forward. Not support that's going to hold you back. Because sitting in the anger... Oh, it feel good. The Bible says in Proverbs, listen, an angry brother is harder to be won than a walled city. Sometimes you like to sit in that angle, right? And a lot of you probably know, you've known my life story. I've gone through so many different things up and down. The death of my mom, the death of my sister, just different assaults. And then recently I went through a divorce and all of those things, even though they were great things in that relationship, right? I only have my parts to where I'm going like, man, I could have done better. There's things I could have done, right? There's times I could be angry. I could put the blame on them. I could, there's a whole lot I could do, but no matter what you're in, you're still grief. There's still loss. There's still real feelings. There's still anger. Just because I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, just because I had oil rubbed all over my head and I have a pastor title, doesn't mean that I don't grieve. Doesn't mean I don't get hurt. Doesn't mean that I... I, I don't suffer in some kinds of way, right? Doesn't mean that I, like you say, joy, sit in depression. In this process, I had one, at one point, had gotten to a place where I had never gotten to this place in my life before. And again, when things are coming back to back to back to back, and if you don't have safe places, hear me, 
I got to a place where only once I thought, I just want to end it. I don't even want to be here. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. And I made a phone call and I made another phone call and the third phone call picked up. And then my therapist ended up calling me back and was like, no, 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 no. But that was a real thing. Did I ever think I would have gone to that place? No. But I was so under, I think, demonic oppression. I think also emotional stress. I think just, you know, just a lot of things going on at the same time, trying to catch your breath. And it became overwhelming. And just for that brief moment, I felt like, whoa, I want to check out. And that's how you know you are not in a healthy space. You're not in a good place. But who would you confess that to? I'm a pastor. Who am I going to confess that to? I'm in the limelight. I'm supposed to be holding you all up. Who am I going to tell? I had to be able to have safe people and safe places to say, man, I don't even want to be here, yo. And so thank God I got out of that, right? So you have to have a person and people that are also going to push you forward, not let you feel comfortable wallowing in it. So again, I can sit in it. I can fuss with my brother. I can be all of that. But it's not like he's going to be writing a whole book on 10 steps to stay stuck. You know, like, sorry, just take five. You know, it feels so good to feel bad. It feels so good to be angry. It feels, yeah, you know what? Just hold on to that bitterness, girl. It looks good on you. That is not what, he, you know, you don't want that. You don't want somebody that's going to be like, uh-huh, I do it too. Yeah, sure. Now, you can have people that are empathetic, compassionate, understanding, and listening and hearing you, and even validate you. And they don't have to keep you contained to a place that is not good for you, right? So you have to have people that are going to push you forward. And then I think that you have to grant yourself permission. Grant yourself permission to be weak, to be weak before God, to pour your complaints out to him, like really, right? So I love that he says that, pour your complaints out to God. So if I didn't have any complaints, he wouldn't need to tell me to pour them out. So he already know I'm going to be complaining and he already knows I'm going to be in situations. And I was thinking about this. And one of the things that the, I've been studying recently is Jacob. And not the deceiving part, okay? <laughs> but Jacob and how he had battled with the Lord. And when he had battled with the Lord and the angels were ascending and they were descending. And he gets his vision. And the Bible says that the angel uh, touched him in his thigh. When he touched him in his thigh, then he had a limp. We, it does not record in the Bible that Jacob ever got healed from that limp. But we know him as one of our founding fathers of the faith. And what am I saying? It was encouraging to me that sometimes somebody could look at Jacob and say, you're disqualified, Jacob. You're limping. You're not even fully healed. Your foot is not even set right back in perfect position. But God did not dismiss Jacob because he battled with him. He did not dismiss him because his leg was not fully healed. He did not dismiss him for the deception uh, he had with Laban. He did not dismiss him. You see, God was able to have a real, revela um, real relationship with Jacob. And he was able to see God for who he was and see himself for who he was. And God had to change his name and say, listen, I know that's who you think you are. And that's, we don't want to hold you in the past. I'm going to rename you and call you Israel. Because you were a deceiver, but now you're Israel. And so that's what I want to say to you. Emotionally, we have to accept that those, that stuff is real. Emotionally, we have to take the time to process that. Emotionally, we have to stop beating ourselves up and thinking we're the worst Christians that ever sat on the planet because we had a bad day, we had a bad attitude, and our emotions got the better of us. Okay, we have to stop blaming ourselves and shaming ourselves and downing ourselves. All right, so now I'm going to bring my brother and we're going to chase it, uh, sit on the seat together. And so this is Pastor Che. Hello. All right, all right. So we are on all sorts of formats tonight. But anyway, so this is my older brother. I know he looks younger because my head is forward and I have the bigger head. And when the bigger head is forward, it looks super big. So if you have big right. heads, whenever you're taking pictures, make sure your big head is behind the little head. <laughs> then you will look normal. <laughs> See, look. <laughs> All right. So yeah. I wanted to just ask some questions. So he has been a pastor for many, many years. Uh, he pastored in Jamaica first for several years. And then he was a pastor here um, alongside me um, in Arlington. And then he is now in California, like mm -hmm. I told you, at Life Church. So one of the things that um, we, we went through the death of our mother. Mm -hmm. 
um, death of our sister. Yeah. We went through the divorces of um, the divorce of our our dad and our mom. Um, we went through different um, mothers coming in our life. Uh, mm -hmm. Four, to be exact, that we have four. Yeah. Um, and so we've just gone through a lot of different things. And so guess what? I want to. I want people to want to know that just because we are pastors or have pastoral experience doesn't mean that we are infallible to real situations like what they're, they've gone through, right? Absolutely. So they've been in those ways. So emotionally, though, I would ask you, like, first I'm saying you have seen a lot of different things that I've had to go through as a, you've witnessed and you are going through some of those same things, too. But also you have the perspective of looking at me. Right. So I want to ask you, you know, in when it comes to emotional um, stability or emotional health, how would you advise a person when they're trying to rebuild and everything seems that you just don't have anything to rebuild? I mean, I remember in a lot of these processes, I would say to you, I have nothing else. <laughs> like I literally feel I have nothing else. And how do you help a person to see the good? How do you help? Pull them out of that dark place. If if you are on the other side of that person, if there's somebody watching right now and they're going through it, or they have somebody going through it, how, what can they do? Give one action that they can do if they're in it, and one action if they're the person that's witnessing it. Okay. If possible. Yeah. Um, I think there are a couple of things. I, I love the three things that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the the things I think about when I think about the three things, and I'll, I'll come back. There's a, there's a relationship in the Bible between Jesus and his disciples and the interesting ways in which he dealt with a grief that he was going through at the time. And, and just to kind of jump into the idea of if Jesus had to deal with emotional stress, the Bible says when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he said to his disciples, my soul like I feel like I'm about to die. That, that, that's, that's the grief that he was feeling. So if Jesus, the son of God, was feeling to the point of death, the, the, the emotional weight that he was carrying felt like he was about to die, then who are you and I? Who are pastors or no pastors or whoever you are? This, this is the son of, if there's any title that really should be above any of this, it's the son of God. And so here it is, Jesus is, is doing that. And when he gets to that place, he says to the, the disciples, could you stay with me for one hour? Could you just stay with me while I go off and pray? So a couple of things are happening here. Number one is, if you think about Jesus, what, does Jesus really need anybody to be with him as he's going through something emotional? You see, sometimes we, like you said it earlier, that some, sometimes we feel like emotionalism or emotions are not spiritual. Is there anyone more spiritual than Jesus? Absolutely not. Right. And yet he was going through this emotional breaking point. And what did he need? He needed two things at the time. He needed people, his friends, his safe space to be with him, to watch him. I can't do this in front of all the disciples, guys. I just need you three to come with me. There's something I'm about to express in terms of emotions. I can't let everybody see, but I can let you see because you're my safe space, mm -hmm. which is different because we just think, oh, the only person Jesus needed was his father. Apparently not. Because when he went through it, he came back and said, could you not just stay with me for one hour in my time of need? Couldn't you stay awake? In my, not even that I needed you to say anything to me. I just needed you to be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oftentimes when we're in that position, and so here's the relationship. One, what did Jesus do? Jesus did, hey, I need God's perspective on this. God, if 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 you can uh, take this cup from me, right? He's trying to get God's perspective on this, but he also needs people to be there and just be with him. Sometimes not even to have the answer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not even I need you to have the answer. I just need your presence. Because what I'm going through is so heavy for me right now. I don't want to go through it alone. And so human presence, Jesus is showing us, human presence is so essential. So if you're in the Jesus position, you're the one going through, then really what you're trying to find is what is God's perspective on this? What is this? 
longer, bigger, eternal perspective. It's very, very difficult in the middle of what you're going through, in the brokenness of what you're going through. It's really difficult to find that. But that's what you're you are driving to the place and trying to get to the place is like, God, do, you, do are you really, really having me go through this night right now? Like, do I really need to be going through this right now? And 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 trying to find God, can I get an eternal perspective on this? Can I get a bigger than what I'm going through right now perspective on this? Because if we get caught up in only what we're going through, then everything feels hopeless. Hope really comes when we recognize that there is a bigger perspective. There's something more that is going on in my life. There's a, I heard about a book recently. I haven't read it uh, by Larry Crabb called um, Shattered Dreams. Mm. And the, Larry Crabb is a, is a psychologist. You ever read one of his books before? Yes. Was Inside he, Out, I think? Yes, he's, yes. he's been there a while. Oh, he's been around a while. <laughs> but one of the things that, and the premise for this book, basically is that you will never be fully satisfied on earth, ever. Yes. And, and it, is a, it is a kind of strange perspective. His whole thing is, if there is a heaven, then there will always be dissatisfaction on earth because there must be something that heaven contains for you that earth cannot contain for you. So therefore, regardless of your dreams, desires, every time you achieve what you think you'll achieve, it will never fully satisfy you mm -hmm. because you never get fully satisfied until you're in the presence of Jesus. So the thing you're really after is not the thing you think will satisfy you, but it's Jesus himself. And sometimes in the moments that we're going through the grief and the hurt and the pain, getting the eternal perspective helps to remind us that, you know what, um, I'm still on earth. And it will never be fully fulfilled, never be completely satisfied. It, I'll never have everything that will make me um, fulfilled here while I'm here, that there is a heaven for a reason. And therefore, when I'm passing through this, like Paul says, these momentary uh, trials, these tribulations I'm going through is working for me in eternal glory. The other side was the disciples and, and their role. So what is their role? Their role has to be, I am here for you. Um, sometimes because you're going through it, you're good. You have good days, bad days. So being there for you often means, hey, what do you need from me now? It doesn't mean that you have to be inquiring all the time. So how are you feeling today? What are you going through today? You don't need to be good. No, here's the thing. What does the person need? You almost need people around you who are sensitive enough to sense when you need to be sharing what you need to be sharing, when you need to receive truth, when you need to receive truth. And when we just need to be almost like we're not going through anything at all, we're just hanging out. And you have to have people around you who are sensitive enough to know your needs at the time. The disciples were not sensitive to Jesus at all. Here's the final thing I want to say about the disciples, which just really blows my mind, is this. That the disciples decided that it was good for them to write this episode about Jesus in the Gospels. That blows my mind. And here's why. Because if I want my leader to look good, I am not writing about his weakness. I am not writing about the time that he needed us to be there for him. I am not writing about the time that he was breaking down and he was losing it and he was in anguish. I'm not writing about that. But these guys were so confident about how much emotion is a part of who we are as humans and that Jesus was fully human, that they felt confident enough to write it so that you and I would read it and say, if Jesus went through that, then who am I to be exempt from that kind of emotional pain? Don't see emotional pain or emotional stress, whatever you're going through as weakness. Don't see it as somehow you're less spiritual because Jesus went through it and the disciples felt it was important for us to know that he went through that himself. And so I, I just want to encourage you, if you're going through something right now, God is close to the brokenhearted. God says, I am close to the brokenhearted. And Jesus himself experienced it so he could identify with every feeling of brokenness, every anguish, every pain that you're facing today. So I think, you know, hopefully you hear a heart on it because I really want you to know that, um, you know, from my particular perspective, 
I do try to share with you that we are we are all going through different things at different times, right? And you know, I never want to just sugarcoat it and say, hey, you know what? Then you're just supposed to just bounce back and and if it's a real struggle for you. And you have to have the opportunity to know that that's why he becomes a very present help in trouble because there's going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're going to need some help because trouble is going to come. And, and so, you know, in these processes and just different seasons in my life, as you've had in your life, there are times that you really thought that you were going to break. And in some cases you did break. And in that breaking, you realized who God was. You realized who you could be. You realized who you didn't want to be. You know, so I think that, um, you know, I was thinking of the whole movie, uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, my favorite line in the Lord of the Rings, the old movie, is when Frodo is going up and he has the precious and he says, listen, I can't carry the precious, but I can carry you. I can't do it for you, but I can carry you. And I think that's the role of a friend. And so someone here says, hey, how can you find a safe place if you don't feel you have that yet? Can I just tell you, here's some things that you can do. Number one, you can really have a conversation with yourself and ask yourself what it is that you need and what the safety look like. Because you may not even know what you're looking for because you haven't defined it. Yeah. So you may actually have it closer to you, but you don't really know what that is yet. And it's okay not to know, but it'd be great to take the journey to find out. Like, do does safe mean that um, I'm not judged? Well, what does not judge mean? Because does not judge mean not being accountable? Ouch. So if you're holding me accountable, were you judging me? Or is it that, no, I'm just calling you out on it, <laughs> right? So you see, so what does safety mean to me? For me, for my particular safety, it means I have the freedom to say whatever I'm going to say because my particular brain works with words. When I hear my own self, that's how I actually process it back to myself. So when I'm hearing myself and how toxic and how um, with so much vitriol and anger and resentment, as I'm saying it, and it's going, I'm able to recognize and go, but I don't like that person. I don't want to be that person. I don't want my heart to become that person. So safety to me means I have to have the freedom to verbally communicate. Another person's safety may mean I can communicate, but I want you also to respond a certain way, right? Safety to another person may mean, well, I don't want you moving your hands and arms because I feel like you're going to hit me because I have trauma with people hitting me. So you have to really decide what safety is. And once you know what safety is, you're able to look around. And the, if there is somebody that you are wanting something from, you have to ask them. I remember in this process, I needed something from my brother. He was doing the, the, my number one need, which was hearing me. And it's just like, like number one skill. Of, I mean, communicating and listening. Normally, you can communicate and you can't listen. Like me. But for him, he can communicate and listen. Talent, right? So, but I had wanted him to ask me if there was anything I needed, but I would run to him every day and just, and he was there. He literally was there, but he didn't ask me the question. So the question was, was I really angry that he asked a question or was it that I wanted more from him that he didn't know that he was supposed to give or did I even tell him what I needed? I didn't. So I got upset because he didn't know what he didn't know because I needed more on that day. It's not that he wasn't willing, he just didn't know that's what I needed. So, but so now I can be like, well, you're not a safe space. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because Jesus did tell the disciples what he needed. Right, so if you tell, <laughs> you tell you what you need, right? And you're not getting it, you have to say no. There's some things really, you do have to turn to God, but there's some things that you can go to people and say, hey, I need this and this and this and this. Are you able or are you willing to try and are you able to give that to me because you have to understand too that what you may be asking may be a 10 for you and it may be a five at their best effort and you've got to see that the effort is still there right so i think is one finding out what you need to be safe so that you can also put safety for you also finding out that there's some things no matter how great the human is we are going to miscalculate the moment we're going to miss an opportunity there's something going to happen 
And it doesn't mean we don't trust anybody. It just means that we can pour over that deficit to the Lord. And like he said, pour our complaint out to him. And then he can come in and say, you know what? Let me heal that wound. But the truth is we do need people. But we cannot put all our expectations on people because they also are going through their own things at the same time, right? So they may have a 70% day and you need 100 and they don't have. So where's that 30% going to go? Now we have to really rely on our relationship with God. And two things too, to add to that. One is that vulnerability <clears throat> is courage. Like it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable. And so you have to also recognize that this is a courage thing for you. Sometimes it's the courage to overcome a certain pride because, <laughs> hey, you know what, I have a certain reputation or I have a certain title or I have a whatever it is. I'm the person that always holds it together and I don't want people to see that I don't have it all together. So you have to also check, hey, am I being a coward when it comes to vulnerability? Like, I just don't want to let people see me weak. Is this my issue I need? It's not that there aren't safe spaces, it's just I've never tested to see if it's safe because I've never allowed myself to become vulnerable. So that's one on the human side. I want to let yeah. you know something like, all right, this is gonna be a unique thing. So when you're looking at what you think you need and also having to consider people even in your need, right? Because everybody can't rotate around your particular need either. So you have to, I know like for me, when I was going through, like I said, we've gone through a so many different things, right? And I remember when my mom had died, when our mom had died, and I did not really need the people to come with all the scriptures. That wasn't a need for me, right? Right? I needed them to tell me the truth. They didn't know what to say. <laughs> they didn't know what to say. But when they were telling me, oh, you know what? It will all work together for good. Ah, oh, you know, weeping endures for a night. Joy yeah. comes in the morning. Not a good, that not was a good not what not I needed, time. right? Hearts were sincere. Right, wanted to find. They wanted to find something to add to the to the situation to help, but it wasn't what I needed. I didn't know what I needed in that moment. Mm -hmm. Right, because I never had this happen before, and they didn't have it happen before. So we have to kind of also give grace. Right, uh, you know, like I said, you know, recently I went through a divorce. Right, and it was a lot of different things that I needed at the time. Right, some people always have. You always have the crowd. Right, and you always have the three. Like he was talking about, you always have people that are close. And the crowd can judge you and your circumstance and everybody connected to you. And then you have people that know, and then you know. And sometimes you can, if you follow the crowd or you follow the push, then you can ruin your own relationships and safe places because you are putting expectations on them that are not even yours. So I want to encourage you when you're in an emotional tough time and you're rebuilding, that you also, there's so many different things to it. One, you have to know yourself. Two, you have to find out what do you need. Three, communicate to those people that you are needing it from. Find out if they have the ability or willingness to do it because then you know how to handle it. Four, really invest in your relationship with God. That's a real thing. And five, do not just be swayed by everybody's perception of something. You've got to know, you know, you've got to know the people that are around you, right? And then there's going to be some fallout, but in every rebuilding, give yourself the permission to do it. You ask the yes. question, if you put yourself in a position, do you ask for forgiveness if you broke your own heart? There are things that, you, of course, there are decisions. Absolutely. And I can look back. Some people say, oh, I don't have any regrets. I only have lessons. No, I have regrets. <laughs> and I have lessons. There are some things I look back and go, oh, my God, girl, please, why? Why? Right? And how do you forgive yourself? The thing is, when you're forgiving yourself, you have to understand that sometimes you make error because different reasons right you're motivated if you can tap into the motivation of why you made that choice did i make that choice because i was needed did i make that choice because i was angry did i make that choice because i was pressured did i make that choice because i was rebellious did i make that choice because i just wanted my own way did i make that choice because it was the best decision i had thought of at the time what was the motivation and you can get to the motivation of it then you can analyze and say okay how will i handle when this situation presents itself again to me and I have to understand that, yeah, I'm going to break my own heart. But what did Pastor Che remind us of? God is close to the, the broken hearted. Heart. And I can come before him like Isaiah. I'm a wretched man. Absolutely. I can come before him and say, God, you know me. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm, I'm good for it. But Tuesday, Thursday, you know, help. You, you have to be real before God. I think that's it. And really just say, I, 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 I messed up. But that's what I want to remind you. If you and I stay in that moment of mess up, though, and define ourselves 
by that moment. Yeah. Then all of that, Pastor Che did this one time. Um, I think I stole it from him and preached a message and people thought I was like really cool. Yes, yeah, she did. Amazing. Yeah, she did. So this example was, I mean, the bomb. I wish I could remember it. I could use it again in my next thing and look amazing again. So he used to preach this sermon, right? I call it Dash. Well, he does it at like funerals, call it Dash, right? The space between kind of where you live and where my book kind of got a piece of it from, right? <laughs> That's a title of my book somewhere. You all know it's on Amazon. But he had done... This example the date, he, the date between when you were born and when you die. Right. A funeral program. Right. But he had switched it up. So it was a funeral message, but he took that thing and switched it up. And what he did was, I'm gonna show it to you. This is what he did. So it's gonna help you. I'm helping you, Joy May. I'm helping you. All right. So he had the rope kind of like this, right? Oh, the rope. Yes. He had the rope. the rope. And he took the rope and he burned a piece of the rope, right? Or charred piece of the rope. And what the point was, because all I remember was this was here was this part of your life. Okay, so we'll use this. Here's this part of your life where the sticker is that you made the bad choice, that you messed up, that you really regret what happened. And we get stuck right here and forget, look at all of this and the rest of our life, that's journey that is still ahead of us. Yeah. And so we never get to enjoy. God is looking at all of the potential, possibility, growth, eternity, all of this we have left. But right here we get stuck just in this moment, and we do ourselves a disservice because we are stuck here, but God's not stuck there. So if we get the chance to say, you know what? That is just a thread in my tapestry. I went to Rome, I think in 2017 or 2018 or somewhere like that. And when, um, when I went to Rome to the Vatican, uh, we walked through the Vatican and there were all these tapestries I mean, you know them, beautiful, beautiful on the outside. Well, of course, you know, me and my daughter, we're a little rebellious, so we had to be nosy, and we went behind the tapestries. We're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be very solemn and quiet, and we went behind the tapestry because I wanted to know. And when you look behind the tapestry, it was full of knots. It was ugly. There was nothing finished. There was nothing smooth behind it, but the picture in front was incredible. And so a lot of your errors, mistakes, dark spots, moments of shame, uh, idiotic things that you go, you know, they are there, but God yeah. still uses those and weaves them into. They're almost necessary. They're necessary. essential to the beautiful picture on that the outside. Yeah. So I just want to let you know that hopefully that illustration, that has always stuck with me, that message that he did. And I know I preached it about 10 times somewhere, but it, even in this process for me, I've had to go right back to that same space and go, but I'm not just a status. I'm not just a period in time. I'm not just a moment. I'm not just a bad decision. No, I'm full of wonder and potential and possibility. And yes, I have those days that I can't even breathe. And yes, I have panic attacks and I cry and I freak out. And, but there are days, man, I crawl yeah. right back up and go, but God, you're still with me. God, you're still faithful. God, you're still, you know, believing in me. God, you still trust me. God, you still call me, Lord. I know I'm limping like Jacob, but you still call me. I know that I murdered the man like Moses, but you still call me. I know I doubt my ability like Jeremiah, but you still call me, God. But I know that I don't know what I'm doing without Paul, but I like Timothy, but I'm here. And I want to encourage you that this, you may carry it with you, but it doesn't define you. Amen. And God can definitely just do way more with what you have left than what you have left. Come on. Now. So leave that in the back, right? Does that help you? You love that illustration, right? It was amazing. So we should just send everybody to, you go to Home Depot and buy your rope and see some of it. And, and keep that right there. So anytime you want to go back to that moment, you go. But I have so much left. So much left. So much left. Well, I hope this was um, mm -hmm. very beneficial for you. I want to just encourage you. Sometimes you said, if you don't have that safe place, I want to let you know that I um, do uh, personal coaching and group coaching. My next group coaching is happening on Tuesday, March the 7th. And group coaching is very important for you because it is a safe place. So I would love the opportunity to be your mentor, to help you go through, because as you know, I've gone through a lot of different things. Am I perfect? No. But am I going to give you the best I have? Yes. And I will leverage my experience um, to help you. So we have a set curriculum. It's live. It's not automated. I'm showing up every day, um, every time for you. Begins March 7th. It's for four weeks. And you can text me at 469-278-4828. Two eight. That's four six nine. I'm gonna put it in here. Four six nine two seven eight 
1-800-242-4828 and just schedule a call with me and let me know, hey, maybe that's the right option for you, right? So I have people that are in private coaching, but I really recommend the group coaching to you. It's a um, less expensive option, but it gives you a community of people. And you have me for a whole solid 30 days. You can call me, text me any single time. I'm there focused on you and getting your dreams. And we deal with emotional recovery. We deal with vision. We deal with getting your goals done and accountability and what's your mindset going to be. And we really get down into it. So I want to let you know, if you don't have a safe place, then we, I can be a safe place for you because one, you have pastoral privilege. So anything you tell me, I can't go tell anybody anyway. So we can just start there. But I want you to get involved and get to your next level by making sure that you make an investment in yourself. How do you crawl out if you don't actually crawl out? Yeah. How do you change if you don't actually change? And I, I, am, I am with you. I wanted my brother to share with you today because a lot of times you hear the stories, but you don't know that there are other kids that went through the story. <laughs> you know, we all have different perspectives and different ways that we handled all of these different trials. But, you know, I think one of the greatest things um, a spiritual leader can have is some experiences sometimes that you have and they can say you know what but this is how God showed up for me and I know he's going to show up for you and so for whatever you're going through I know that uh you just pour your complaints out to him start there and ah uh, yes Ramona hi Ramona you know Ramona Shay yes, hey <laughs> yeah and that's it right Ramona we always supported each other you know and one day we'll get the backstories on Support looks like to different to different people, right? But sometimes you don't you don't want to ever be in a position where you are going to put somebody in a detrimental position either. And so again, when it comes to safe places, calling or getting uh, help, you can't follow what people think and what they want you to yeah. do. You have to know the relationships you have, That's right. right? And you got to stand on those things. So be encouraged, but join my class. Make sure that you text me 469-278. 4828. I can't wait to see you and text me tonight so I can put you on the schedule and I'll call you tomorrow and we will talk about it. And yeah, so that's that's that. I only have four spots left and I want to make sure that you get it in, right? So thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed it and I will see you all next time. God bless you and to all a good night. See you tomorrow at seven. Ta -da.